Mrs. Okay, some of you may know about Mississippi appendectomies. Have you heard that phrase? Those were not appendectomies. Those were forced sterilizations that were committed upon black women in the South. And as a result of the promotion of this eugenics ideology um, and the perversion of science, it's, it's, it's debunked that, you know, white people are better than anybody else. Um, this led to the creation of laws all over the country and specifically in California, starting in 1909, that led to forced sterilizations. And at the beginning of this, um, you know, it was white working class women. It was also some wealthy white women who, you know, their uh, parents and relatives were trying to get their money. And there's a lot of stuff about this on the web. But eventually it became racialized. And in the state of California, um, it was primarily Latina women, also, also Latina men. Um, but it was primarily women who became, who were forcibly sterilized within state institutions, mental hospitals where they, they shouldn't have been committed to begin with. Um, and it has continued even up into the mid 2000s, unbelievably. Um, and I see somebody putting in the chat about the new documentary about Belly of the Beast that correctly talks about contemporary forced sterilizations within California prisons. So this board member at our church, Robert Milligan, was also a physicist. He led Caltech. He was also the head of the Huntington Library out here in Pasadena. So he had a lot of power and a lot of influence. And he was part of um, an organization called the Human Betterment Foundation based in Pasadena, which promoted eugenics and forced sterilization and was a conscious model and in direct communication with the Nazis. So we're talking back in the 20s and 30s. And we all know what happened in Germany. But they looked to us in the United States as a model for the way that we were, you know, treating um, black and brown people. And I mean, it, it's a lot of people don't know this, but we were a model to them for their atrocities. So our purpose in um, starting this truth and reconciliation process was to reckon with the fact that one of our prominent members, and he was actually a co-founder of the church, um, was behind this type of horrific stuff. And so we were always though trying to do it in a spiritual fashion. So we were looking to our principles and purposes and we got spiritual grounding by having ministers on our committee. And um, we tried to bring it to the attention of the congregation by making this information and making it part of rituals in the church service. So we've had like four or five church services where we've talked about this, but we've also grounded it in spiritual, the spiritual truths that we believe in and in rituals. So for example, when this information was first um, made a part of our first service, the minister who, who um, gave the sermon led us in a grounding ritual to help us cope with the horribleness of the information that we were about to trigger them with. So we've, we've always tried to take that approach. And then after services, we try to have discussion so people can debrief and talk about this stuff. And actually the very first step um, was um, making sure that we had historical facts correct. So we had a book that we used as a reference that was written by a trained historian and sociologist. And after our very first service, he was present to give a presentation about his book and to lead a discussion with the congregation. And, um, We've had other services since then focusing on other themes um, as we continued in this process. And let me first say that I and my committee are not experts in running truth and reconciliation processes. I have to tell you that we figured this out as we went along. 
We looked for templates. We could not find them at the time. Um, now that we've been doing this for so long, we've been doing this since July, 2018, we have found templates and they've kind of confirmed and affirmed what we've been doing, but we basically figured this out on our own. Um, so we want, to be a, we want to be a model now. We want to be a conscious model of restorative and transformative justice. This is how we are making, this is part of the way that we are making reparations for um, the horrific acts that happened in the past. And I know I have a limited amount of time, so I'm gonna just briefly highlight a couple of things. Um, besides um, collecting money and sending it to various organizations such as Dignity and Power Now and California Latinas for Reproductive Justice, um, we also joined in in promoting the passing of a law that did pass just this past July, which is about um, paying repara reparations to surviving victims of forced sterilization, of which there are about 400. Um, they're very old. Um, so next week, there's actually going to be a meeting to talk about implementing this law, doing community outreach um, so that, um, one, we can educate the community and at least the state of California about what we're doing and why, about the fact that eugenics is still very much alive and well, and is still very much a pillar of white supremacy. And to be on, you know, and to work to dismantle it. And there are a lot of, I mean, in our work, in doing this work, we've just run into so many different people that are doing the work of dismantling eugenics. Um, and I'm going to put into the chat my um, email address in case you have any specific questions about our process. Um, so you can reach me. I have like a lot of information that I can share with you. Um, and we are still in process of doing this. What we one of the one of the rooms that our congregation our church was named after Robert Milligan. We have taken his name down. And what we plan to do is to rename the room. We plan to, to again, stay spiritually based in that process. We plan to examine how things get named, who gets things named after them, um, avoiding financial elitism. Um, and um, we, we plan to develop a ritual around renaming and make it part of a church service. So that is how we are, we are continuing th this process in a spiritual way. So um, that's a really fast explanation, um, but I guess I'll stop right there in case anybody has a couple of questions. There, there are any questions you uh, need to unmute yourself. And if I, um, and I know you're on a tight um, schedule, Reverend Foy, so um, I might take one and then get going and then I'll leave the rest of the questions that might come up to Luis Sierra Campos. All right, great. Yes, let's get, well, do we have one question for uh, Ms. Perkins? And I see that um, Rabbi Lynn is saying they can write questions in the chat and then we'll collect them. So, oh, I see that I've made a mistake in my email. Let me fix it real quick. Hey, Donna, I, yes. I, I sent uh, the correction. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, thank you, Luis, my backup guy. <laughs> Okay, well, if there aren't any questions right now, um, if any percolate and, you know, Luis is here, like I said, and um, I will um, just say good night to everybody. I'm so glad that we, I was able to be a part of this. And um, I look forward to hearing about what happened after I leave, okay? Oh. So thank you so much. All right, thank you, Donna, for, uh, for, for sharing with us. Uh, Bye. -bye. Hey, okay, thank you. Uh, and Luis is still on, so we have any questions later on. Uh, we, we can uh, come back and he can answer them uh, for us. Uh, 
I my my our, our guests are actually uh, on on the East Coast, so I'm going to ask uh, uh, Senator Wright if he would be so uh, kind and so uh, gracious to let our uh, guests go first. Uh, they're in uh, you guys in New York, uh, Connecticut. Yeah, okay, and it's getting kind of late there for them, so we're going to try to give them an opportunity uh, to 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 share with us. Uh, and uh, but we will definitely want you to stay on because we want you to look at this article that was uh, again published today uh, by our former state uh, senator uh, Roger Wright. So if that's okay with you, uh, Senator, then uh, I want to bring up uh, Dr. David Raglan and uh, Isra Allison, and they're going to tell you who they are with and a little bit about themselves, and then we're going to hear their presentation. Uh, and I kind of coined it, just phrased it uh, about reparations is more than just writing a check. So we want to welcome uh, Dr. Rag Dave, Dr. David Raglan and uh, Ms. Isra Allison. Hey everyone, um, I just changed the I just changed the name so you can see us both. Can you all hear us? We're actually, we happen to be in the same room because we've been doing a work retreat for the last couple of days. So um, a number of uh, our staff were here uh, and we haven't seen each other for a long time because of COVID. So it's really exciting to, to see people um, in person. And um, it's really good to be here on the call. Um, and, and Maybe we'll just both introduce ourselves, mm -hmm. a little bit about ourselves, and then we'll uh, continue on. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm so grateful to be here. Uh, thank you, Reverend Foy, for setting this up and for inviting us to meet all of you wonderful folks who are doing the work out in California. Um, we became familiar with Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity through Rabbi Lynn, so thank you so much for the introduction as well. Um, we're hoping to, to do a lot more work in the future. My name is Isra Allison, and I'm based in uh, North Carolina, but we're, like David said, we're here in Connecticut here for a retreat um, with the Grassroots Reparations Campaign, which is powered by the Truth Telling Project. And our aim is to bring truth and reconciliation into conversation across, especially congregations, and to make sure that we are able to uh, promote a spiritual practice um, and making sure that reparations becomes a spiritual practice. So that's really our philosophy. We're, and I'm one of the organizers, one of the, um, the campaign managers of this, of this organization. And we're working towards, um, like I said, having conversations with all of you, making sure that we can get into as many congregations as possible um, to really talk about um, the history behind re reparations and, and really talk about the history behind, behind slavery and some of our traditions to make sure that the conversations can continue and people can get an educational background as far as why we're doing what we're doing and also to make sure that there's healing involved. So I'm very grateful to be in this space, to learn from all of you. And um, again, to just continue to work with you all. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm really, you know, I, I think maybe I can start this conversation with just thinking about, for me, reparations as a spiritual practice um and i think that um we're we're in the middle of this uh public conversation um that's that's very polarized um you know given like all of the the various issues that we're facing um and i think our country is in this place um and a, and a lot of people in leadership in a place where there's a refusal to face the, the truth about the history that uh, we came from um, and that we share together. And part of the early work that um, I was doing along with so many other activists um, who are responding to police violence, um, particularly in um, Ferguson um, was to look and, and that's why i'm so I, i'm really honored to be on this call um and i hope to to talk to to donna 
uh, and uh, a little bit more about the truth and reconciliation process that's happening. Because um, if we don't know, if we don't have the truth about what happened, um, it's really difficult to, to get free. It's really difficult to face up to the reality of what's happening now. You can deny something happened in the past, um, then you can deny the present conditions. And so um, after Mike Brown was murdered, a number of us got together, uh, community activists, and began the process of creating a truth commission around reparations. And we didn't, we didn't use those terms, truth and reconciliation, uh, because there was just a lot of critiques around that term reconciliation, especially because of uh, the experience of having, um, you know, many of the people, uh, liberal white folk um, who were in our group uh, or who were a part of uh, the conversation, really pressing our communities to think about reconciliation and particularly forgiveness. And um, I, I've always believed in forgiveness. Uh, just my own uh, spiritual traditions thought that it was, it, or it, it, for me as a, as a spiritual person, forgiveness has always helped me to move on. But forgiveness in our community is more than a spiritual matter. It's a political and material matter. And so for me, we were in Ferguson after spending about a year uh, building up and establishing a truth process. And there were um, a lot of people coming to hear folk talk about their experience with police violence. People were coming to hear people talk about their relatives who were no longer with us. And there were lots of white tears. And in, in those moments, particularly the last hearing that I was at, um, that made me angry. Um, it was, I wasn't angry because people were, were feeling empathy. I was angry because we were running up on the history of the East St. Louis race massacre, where the drummer for those hearings, his family had escaped from East St. Louis in a rickety boat across the Mississippi River because the Missouri patrol were turning Black people away who were escaping lynch mobs, who were escaping you know, a, a violent mob of white folk terrorizing them. And I was angry because the people who were experiencing police violence went home or were gonna go home to the same material conditions, to the same communities being occupied by police, the same communities that were being underhoused, the same communities where food deserts existed and still exist, the same communities, right, where people were being um, over um, exploited by creditors, right, uh, according to um, a Pew Research report about how Black communities are more likely to be. Uh, black and brown communities are more likely to be harmed by or, or preyed upon by debt collect collectors. The, the same community that, that uh, we were picking up um, tear gas can canisters uh, from that, that were used in, in war zones uh, around the world. And so um, I began and our friends, we all began to think that reparations had to be part, had to be part of 
truth and reconciliation, not just part of it. Reparations has to be the midpoint between truth and reconciliation. Um, the author of Dear White Christians writes, um, if white people want racial reconciliation, they should pay reparations. And so it's not just about the payment though. And truth and reconciliation for me was um, coming from a deep rooted place of spirituality and a deep rooted place uh, of humanism and international human rights. And also um, reparations comes from that same perspective, the deep commitment to human rights, especially laid out by uh, the United Nations, particularly after the Conference on Racism in South Africa, when the world community got together and said that gross crimes against humanity like slavery and colonization uh, require reparations, like that should be the response. And they, they laid out reparations in five dimensions that in COBRA and NARC similarly adopts, describing it in different ways, but uh, they looked at reparations as compensation. Yeah, I'll cut a check. I mean, especially in this country where money uh, means so much, money is God in the United States. And so um, to have people say, well, money's not that important, let's just focus on forgiveness. It's important to you, so quit planning. And then um, the other dimensions include satisfaction, which involves education and memorial building um, and educating the society about what happened. It also involves healing, which has spiritual, mental, and physical dimensions as we look at the intergenerational harm and trauma done as a result of colonization and enslavement and forced migrations. But also I think about the spiritual perspective, how our original religions were stolen, how colonization uh, forced people to separate from traditional practices. One of the things that we could think about is um, the way that the uh, Anglican Church created the slave Bible in 1808 and propagated it in throughout the Caribbean and parts of the South. And the slave Bible removed all um, mentions and aspects of freedom and liberation, right? So how do you, if you're a Christian, how do you promote this kind of like, you know, gerrymandered Christianity, right? Um, and then, but not just that, like that own twisting of religion, right, is, is a part of the oppressive systems that even hold people who create those systems and benefit it and try to uphold those systems. And so when I think about the spiritual uh, uh, problem and healing that needs to take place, I think about the disconnection between us and our ancestors, the disconnection of people uh, with each other, with our planet. And then the other dimensions are restitution, returning what was stolen, and then guarantees of non-repeat. Don't do that shit no more. How do you get there though? How do you get to not doing what has been done to get us where we are?
especially as you all mentioned earlier, um, the way the oppressive systems that were created during slavery and colonization still exist and still operate like prisons and uh, policing, right? Policing as we know it in this country is a result of the Slave Fugitive Act and people calling the police on black people, right? Was, was mandated by law. That same mandate was also present during the colonization and conquest of this land when indigenous people were murdered on site. Often um, scalps uh, were used to buy land to build churches. And so like this, this truth telling piece is so much a part of reparations and it is difficult. And I think that reparations is um, to me connected to accountability. It's connected to, especially when we think about guarantees of non-repeat, um, not just like saying, look, I'm for abolition, but being invested, like invested um, through our retirement fund in companies that benefit from black and brown suffering. How many people have weapons manufacturer in their investment portfolios? How many people are, are buy brawny paper towels? How many people brought, buy Sabra hummus? How many people buy Mayfair bed products? Because if you do, you're sending energy to continue oppression. Because these companies are deeply invested in injustice that directly impacts Black, Brown, and Indigenous bodies and destruction of our planet. So for me, unraveling ourselves in the complicity of violence against people in our planet is necessary for repair and accountability. And so like the spiritual practice is not like going to church and praying about reparations. How many people heard the saying, you pray with your feet? Reparations as a spiritual practice is about how we use our energy in every part of our lives. How do we unravel ourselves from the complicity of injustice? And so I'll just pause here for questions because I can go on and on. And sometimes, you know, talking this late at night, um, I, I be like, getting upset <laughs> as I talk, just thinking about what I'm talking about. So I would love to uh, invite Israel to say some words and also to, um, um, and, and I'll just close with talking about the campaign that we're involved in. We're really focused on building a culture of reparations. And some of the primary ways that we're doing that is um, through, creating uh, reparation Sunday and Sabbath um, so that faith-based institutions um, and ethically centered organizations can have a period of time that, that there's a commitment in their calendar to repair. So for instance, the next reparation Sunday is coming up on December the 19th. I know that's close to uh, many folks' uh, traditional holidays, but I want to encourage you to, to think about that as uh, something that you can do. And it begins on December the 3rd. Uh, December the 3rd, I'm sorry, December the 2nd is the International Day for the Abolition of Slaves um, and the Abolition of Slavery. And it's, it's, you know, we still have to have the abolition of uh, enslaved people because 
you know, slavery exists in our prisons because it's a constitutional loophole there. And people are still like after every major um, natural disaster when kids don't have support, people are sold into sexual and other forms of slavery. Um, it still exists. And if we can't acknowledge the past in this country, how the hell are we going to help any other country do it? How are we going to stop the destructive patterns of colonization and theft of land, right, that continues to happen and that the U.S. supports? And so we look at uh, a culture of reparations as people engaging in practices that's unraveling a system rooted in injustice uh, and built on colonization and slavery. And we, we have two periods each year in August where there's Reparation Sunday. Um, and then those periods begin with this period of reflection and preparation for groups and congregations so that they can be thinking about and preparing for Reparation Sunday. Um, and Isra, mm -hmm. do you wanna share any, any, any more and uh, sure. go ahead. Sure, I, I just want to encourage every one of us to be thinking about what David brought to the table tonight um, in terms of the political elements and the spiritual elements and the elements that we all exist in in this country and how specifically how we are able to make amends and 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 create a space of repair in our communities and that's really our aim but i also think that there's a there's an educational aspect to this that all of us who have this knowledge it's our duty to share to share as much information with our communities. And that's really the, the pattern that we're trying to create, the culture that we're trying to create, starting with um, religious entities, starting within congregations, because that is the safe space, that's the, sa the space of trust. And, and that's where communities are often built. And, and, and we have the opportunity here to, to really kind of take take our past harms and really acknowledge them, as David pointed out, acknowledge past harms that have been done to our people and to our communities and understand what's existing in our, in our, in our cities, our towns and, and every, every place around us. And from a political aspect, my background is, is, um, is politics. I, I do work on, on campaigns traditionally. And um, as I work on issues such as social justice and, and racial justice and um, the money that is involved in politics and the corruption that exists there, um, everything really come, goes hand in hand with what we're trying to do, um, really making sure that we can take a step back and, and recognize, like we said, the past harms that have been done, but really understand the people that we put in these places to to represent us right in our leadership um, to make sure that the knowledge is there and, and sort of making sure that we can create a better world for all of us um, and i will say you know the the path to to um you know engaging in in our systems and the and the activity that we that we end up sort of interacting with, such as the products that we, what, that we purchase, the, the companies that we, the, it, that we interact with, the, um, the vendors that we associate with, it all matters. Um, and that, that circle of uh, accountability and trust is what we're trying to build as well. So, so making sure that we're all just making the right decisions. But I think, like I said, it really starts with the education. So. I think um, just starting with, as Dave mentioned, um, the acknowledgement and the, the ability to create these safe spaces for people to be able to talk about their own experiences, to be able to unlock some, um, some past harms that people have experienced and to be able to understand the truth will definitely lead us to the path of reconciliation. Um, so that's all I have to say about that, but um, I'm looking forward to working with all of you hopefully soon.
All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Raglan and uh, Ms. Uh, Allison. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so now we want to uh, open it up for uh, a Q&A, some questions. You have questions for uh, comments uh, to either Dr. Raglan or uh, to Ms. Allison. Uh, we allow uh, you to do so now. Yeah, this is Sherry uh, Morrison. I have a question. Can you give us more specifics about what you do on the reparation Sundays or Sabbaths? Um, mm -hmm. Is it mainly getting people together in the space and doing education or are there other activities? Sure. So, um, so usually like, um, here's an example on December 2nd, which is the, um, uh, International Day for Abolition of en Enslaved People. We um, encourage and 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 the other. So let me let me put it like this: There are two times of year when there is a Reparation Sunday, um, and the Reparation Sunday in August begins with the period of preparation on Juneteenth. So on Juneteenth and December the second. Uh, we encourage people to do a community conversation and we have a toolkit for that conversation um, and uh, we can send that to you. Uh, but that conversation is to support leading people up to Reparation Sunday. And on Reparation Sunday, um, you're, uh, there are, in, 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 in most spiritual traditions, there are passages that relate to reparations. We also consider uh, the text of people who um, have spoken about injustice and have put their life on the line to tell the truth also a sacred text. And we encourage readings from those texts uh, because they're reminders to the people. Um, part of it is acknowledging that we're sacred and slavery was wrong because we're sacred. All of us are sacred. And what we do in the lives that we live are important. And so when people speak out about those conditions, that's deeply important and urgent. And so sharing those things uh, on Reparation Sunday are, are important. And um, we usually encourage people to, to do some sort of ritual, um, to have some type of sermon about it. Uh, we have sample sermons. We also have prayers in different spiritual traditions that are specifically um, directed to and focused on um, reparations for those communities. Um, and for us, um, every Reparation Sunday, we did um, and and have had a um, a ceremony which you can find online, and we our ceremonies are rooted in, in um, Afro spirituality, um, and so we've had uh, a Yoruba priestess uh, Louisa Tish um, lead those, and we've also had interfaith ceremonies as well. Um, and there, there are probably at this point hundreds of congregations around the country who've held reparations Sabbath days or Sundays so far. And we have some examples from those and Isra just shared uh, some of the things that are involved in. But I think one of the most important pieces is not doing it alone or trying to go this alone, but organizing people in your congregation and leadership um, to think about reparations. David. Thank you. Um, my name is David Mayer, and I, this is very inspiring to, to hear uh, your speaking. It's also extremely painful. Uh, and, and I appreciate your sharing your truths as you see what is happening, has happened in the past. and. Um, I think in the last days, we, we're reminded as we watched a, a jury selection in Georgia that looks no different than 50 years ago after the modern day lynching of a young black man. And I think we're all 
um, of, in horror of, of what we're watching. And um, I think within our communities, we need to remind ourselves how much it's re-stimulating to our black American brothers and sisters. And, and for that, um, we white people need to take responsibility. So I just wanna share that. Um, I am also a founder in an organization called Reparation Generation. Um, you can visit our organization called reparationgeneration.org. Um, we are a, a multiracial organization, which is um, addressing uh, truth and reconciliation. And we have some issues on our website. You can see some sections, but we're also trying to help be one of the many threads in this movement towards truth, reconciliation, and reparation, because it will take many. We acknowledge that this is going to not go as fast as we wish it would go, but sometimes it takes a long time and therefore that's why we call ourselves a generation. We will get there as a movement, um, as a generation. We also call ourselves a reparation generation because as you all may know, over the next 20 to 30 years as we pass, we will be passing forward $70 trillion of wealth. Much of it ill-gotten, some of it stolen, some of it earned on the backs of black and brown Americans. And therefore we're asking our generation to take a moment and think about what is the legacy we wish, wish to leave for our children and our children's children. Right. It teaches me often to think about my children and my children's children. And unfortunately we've spent way too much time thinking about that legacy looking like wealth in the form of material goods or money. And I wish to encourage um, the, in this group of interfaith uh, practitioners, the idea that we need to re-look at what it means to leave a legacy. And I'm hoping we can look at changing it from wealth to a legacy of wealth that looks like having communities that are connected, that I walk in a place where I'm celebrating in love and in harmony and not in violence and anger. And I think we need to think about just working together for that better world and not one that has all this consolidation of goods in one hand. Lastly, I just wanna ask, and this is my question, so thank you for the commercial, um, but mostly my question is, where is the intersection with making reparative, judgment, reparative transfer payments of wealth now, given that we will take a generation to get to healing and to reparative judgment? because there are many people who are on this path now who recognize the truth and are ready to make a personal or collective reparative transfer of wealth. And what's your thoughts on that? And I'll listen now, thank you. I'm, I'm glad you said that, and you're right. Um, this is one of the, and people should know what David is talking about is the transfer of wealth from baby boomers to their kids. It's not just, the amount that you name, but it's gonna be the largest transfer of wealth in human history. Not only that, it's gonna cost $95 trillion to address climate change. Let me say that again. It's gonna cost $95 trillion to address climate change. And what communities are gonna be on the front lines for that? Who's the most vulnerable to climate change disaster? And so um, you should check out Olufemi Tawo. Um, and um, Robert Lynn, can you write his name in there? I have a big quote I was going to share in the chat, so I don't want to write it yet. Olufemi Tawo, he has a book coming out about climate change and reparations. And on November the 30th, we have an event coming up, um, a teach-in about climate change and reparations. And to speak to your question, um, um, I actually uh, am the director of reparations uh, for an impact investment firm. And we work directly with transfers of wealth um, as well as the grassroots reparations campaign. So um, if you go to jubileejustice.org, some of the things that we're doing, for instance, is we use uh, impact investment money and redistribution of wealth money or reparative money to, to run an SRI, uh, which is a, a rice pot project that is uh, climate resistant um, and is ran in for over 20 black farms around the Southeast seaboard uh, to create 
um, climate disaster resistant uh, crops that are, are done naturally. Um, additionally, the grassroots reparations campaign uh, and Truth Telling Project has a rapid repair fund where we fund um, activists uh, and we also provide free therapy. Um, and so those are some of the ways that we're doing it. And there are loads of other groups as well. Um, but I think that the most important redistribution, I think the consciousness is most important because you can put money in the wrong places if you're not conscious. So people have to do their own research and their own spiritual journey, but you can, you can also support movements that are doing well and helping other people. I think the criteria for that is, is the group that you're supporting thinking about people in the you know, future generations? Are they directly supporting communities? Right, and when you get those answers, that's where you think about um, redistribution of wealth and wealth transfers. Um, and then I think the other piece is that, um, you know, um, how do we have a reparative relationship? Like, how does that begin? Um, and that begins in showing up showing up for abolition work, right? Showing up to free political prisoners, right? Um, it shows up in fighting against uh, voter suppression. It shows up in fighting against police violence. It shows up in putting your life on the line. Um, in the face of rising injustice and violence against people. It shows up with, um, you know, there's an article called decolonization is not a metaphor. Like reparations is not a metaphor. So I'm glad you brought that up. But it also, if you are working on, it's jubileejustice.org. If you, Okay, I see that. All right, so um, I, I think that, you know, part of it is, you know, it's a complex process. If you have land um, that your family has had in ownership for a long time, what does that look like in um, letting that land go back to its indigenous, um, the, the indigenous people who lived there before? especially when the result of European colonization on this land, I'm, I'm not, you already know, you live in the Bay Area, you, are, you all are in Oakland, so you know what I'm talking about. Like it's, it's oil spills and pollutions at every turn, it's continued extraction from people from the planet, for what? A few, like what? Mm -hmm. so, so I think that, you know, there's a lot of things to do. There's, in addition to investing in people who need it, how are you disinvesting from injustice? Um, I like this quote a lot. I just wanted to share that as, as well from Amos Wilson. And it says, justice requires not only ceasing and desisting of injustice, but also requires punishment or reparation for injuries and damages inflicted for prior wrongdoing. The essence of justice is the redistribution of gains earned through the perpetration of injustice. If restitution is not made, and yeah, I, I lost the thought, but you all see what I put in there. <laughs> hey, well, thank you, Dr. Dr. Ragland. Uh, again, thank you, uh, Ms. Allison. 
Uh, and thanks for the questions. Uh, good question, good questions. Uh, so uh, again, want to remind you about the Reparation Sunday uh, in December of 19, on December the 19th. Those of you who do uh, engage in worship uh, on Sunday, uh, we would ask that, uh, that you really strongly consider uh, holding the Reparation uh, Sunday event uh, at your uh, congregation or faith group. Uh, and I think uh, Dr. Raglan can get you information over to you about you know, how to conduct uh, one of those services. We also, uh, Iron for Child Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity, uh, preparing a toolkit uh, that we will also get out to uh, uh, all of you, especially those of you on our email list uh, that could be helpful uh, in assisting you in terms of preparing for uh, Reparations Sunday or other events you, want, you might want to hold uh, during uh, your calendar year. So again, thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Raglan and uh, Ms. Allison. Now, I want to turn uh, to uh, my friend, uh, former state senator, uh, Roderick Wright. He wrote an article uh, uh, and it was, was published in the LA Sentinel. Uh, and this article really ties into what uh, has been discussed tonight. It was ironic that uh, when I sent the email out about the meeting and the, and the theme for this meeting, uh, Senator Wright was in, in the middle of writing his, uh, his article, and uh, our conversation was on the, at, at the same language and basically the same tone. Uh, and so I wanted him to invite to kind of just uh, uh, allude to his article. I sent it to uh, most of you. I hope that you got a chance to read it. If not, I'm try to share it on the screen. Uh, basically, he can just address, uh, uh, address some points for us, especially as it relates to uh, reparations. Uh, so, uh, Senator, are you there? Yes. Okay, good. Let me okay. see. In, you mm -hmm. know, and again, I, I appreciate the, the conversation. One of the, the things that you have when you're a recovering politician is that you, you tend to see the world in a kind of reality of what can happen. Um, we just saw Tuesday that a state like Virginia almost went back to Trump. Uh, we've seen since Biden's election, a number of things have happened. Um, it, it becomes important that in, the, in Biden's election, and I'm digressing a bit, but, but I'm still on point. You know, Biden got elected in large part because George Floyd got killed. As a, as a political operative, as I've been for close to 50 years, if George Floyd doesn't get killed, Donald Trump would have won the presidency again. Yeah. As painful as that is to say, but the movement that occurred with the murder of George Floyd inspired a lot of people to come out and do things that they might not have otherwise done that caused Biden to win. And again, while, while I would not attempt to say, for example, that infrastructure is not important. I would not say that climate change is not important. But where we have to be careful is that those weren't the issues that got Biden elected. People were looking for the John Lewis police reform bill. That didn't happen. People were looking for uh, issues relative to voting rights. Those things didn't happen. That's why Virginia went the way that it did and we almost lost New Jersey. That's why I'm afraid to say that we will probably lose the House and the Senate next year. Because if we don't start talking about the things that the voter is interested in, then the voter gets turned off and they don't show up. The concept that caused me to write my article relative in part to reparations was in, in part, a couple of weeks ago, we had here in California, a plot of land in a city called Manhattan Beach that was returned to the Bruce family and it was stolen from them over a hundred years ago. And the, the state legislature moved to deed it back and the city and county or the county of Los Angeles moved to deed it back. 
But one of the things that also happened during the election or the, the, the recall election was that one of the candidates was actually saying that if reparations were to be paid, that they should be paid to the slave masters because they were the ones who actually lost property as a result of the Civil War. And I thought, this guy's got to be insane. <laughs> but when you back up and listen to people who have that point of view, and there are many of them, he's not alone in that, in that concept. And what many of these people do is, what is common in America is you blame the victim. And so you say, you know what, if those black people would simply work harder, if those black people would simply do this, if those Indians had simply done whatever. And again, it, it ignores the fact that there were numerous things that took place after slavery. So let's stop slavery and move forward. So what happened immediately after slavery? Well, you know, the first African-American elected to the United States Senate, Hiram Rebels was elected after slavery. There were numerous members of Congress elected after slavery. And there were many black businesses that were beginning to prosper after slavery. Well, what happened? Well, there was a thing called the Compromise of 1877. And if you look in your history book, what happened? There, there weren't enough electoral votes for James Hayes to be elected. And so the compromise was that they took all of the Southern states, all of the Northern soldiers went out who were holding the peace. Inside of a year, all of the black elected officials in the South were gone. Not some, all. In fact, it became illegal for a black person to even try to vote, let alone run for office. And most of the businesses were wiped out. One of the other things that is seldom discussed is that with the 13th Amendment, which outlawed slavery, there was a clause in there, ladies and gentlemen, that said, unless you committed a crime. Now it didn't define what a crime was. So many thousands of black men were arrested and jailed and then sold into slavery through what was then called convict leasing. And what was their crime? Vagrancy, what does that mean? You were walking down the street and you didn't have a job that was approved by white people. Let me, let me say that again, because. I can see people going, what? You were walking down the street and you were arrested for not having a job that was approved by white people. Therefore, you were a vagrant. And once the sheriff arrested you, he sold you into slavery to the same farmers and the other people who had slaves before, but it was worse because you were not just property. He had no need to feed you or clothe you because if you died, he would simply go get another one. That program lasted until 1972. So when people say, oh, we, we got rid of slavery, like 1972. I mean, there are numerous other things that if you read my article that I talk about. Up until 1968, it was legal in the United States to discriminate against Black people in housing. The Fair Housing Law was passed in 1968, and it was signed by Lyndon Johnson two months after Martin Luther King was assassinated. Now, we saw a growth in Black home ownership, which creates a ability to have wealth and to have transference of wealth to your heirs. But then came 2008, when we saw again, exploitation primarily of black people in the real estate industry. Today, ladies and gentlemen, there are fewer black homeowners in, 2000, in 2021 than there were in 1968. We're in, in South Central, we have an expression, we're hustling backwards. We're, we're, we're not moving forward, we're hustling backwards. So the transference of wealth is moving in the opposite direction that it needs to go. And there are numerous other things that I think we could get to. But one of the things that we're going to have to do, ladies and gentlemen, is we're going to have to define reparations. 
we're going to have to make it something that is saleable. And you go, well, well, clearly we could write a check. No, you, you can't write a check. Because if you simply wrote a check, that presumes that the people that you wrote the check to would understand how to protect the money. Well, well why does he say that? Let's go back to the beginning of this century in 2000s. Thousands of African-Americans lost their homes because of real estate scams that resulted in the great second Great Depression that occurred in 2008. Well, what do you mean? People borrowed money on their houses that they could not afford to pay back and they lost their houses. And if you go through some of those neighborhoods today, you'll see expensive automobiles sitting on blocks because people bought cars that they couldn't afford and they bought cars that they couldn't afford to maintain. And in some cases they ended up losing the house and the car. So we've got to be careful that we don't simply say, oh, we're going to give people a check because all you're going to do with the check is either deposit it in the bank or spend it on things that are largely owned by the same people that you think you got to be with. We want to try as best we can, brothers and sisters, that knowledge and opportunities are the things that you want to try to, to get a, a good grip on. Simply giving people money is not sufficient. And if you really want to see your heart broken on one day, you ain't got nothing to do, and you want to see your heart broken, go to the probate court in downtown Los Angeles and watch people losing their homes because they didn't have wills, they didn't have trust, and they didn't have a family situation where that transference of wealth could be maintained. I'm not suggesting at all that we're not entitled to a number of reparations. That's why I was so proud when I was there to watch the Bruce family get their property back. There was the Lewis family in, uh, in Georgia that actually was able to get their 40 acres. They didn't get the mule, but the Supreme Court granted them their 40 acres. But we want to be clear when we're talking about those reparations that it's more than simply money. It's more than simply saying, oh, we're gonna write a check and give you something because if that's all you get, it'll be gone in short term. What we've got to make sure that we do is provide knowledge and skill going forward because those things can't be taken away and stolen from you as easily as money can be done. And again, when you hear people say, oh, if only those black people had one of the things that I look at is all of the things, I mentioned the vagrancy law, I mentioned Jim Crow, I mentioned housing discrimination, I mentioned redlining that took place, redlining that still occurs. In Los Angeles, we had a real big thing where there was a thing called racial exclusions on deeds. Many of you, if you have a house in California, if you look at the deed, it will say, you can't sell your property to a black person. That law was ultimately overturned as unenforceable. It wasn't thrown out, it was just unenforceable. So the discrimination in economics, the discrimination against black people in many instances continues to this day. It is morphed into different elements of how it works, but the discrimination economically has not stopped. And we've got to make sure that we're able to educate people so that they're able to withstand many of the challenges that are going to come forth. So it's, it is a tough battle that we face and it's not over. I mean, I looked at the, 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 again, the election the other day, and I looked at it, as I mentioned earlier, in the context of people marched after George Floyd was killed. Uh, LeBron James, was one of the people who was a hero for me in the election. Again, I've done elections for 50 years. LeBron James did something that a lot of people don't recognize. He created a polling place in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He created a polling place in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He created a polling place in Atlanta, Georgia. And these polling places were in the basketball arenas. So as opposed to people having to stand outside in the weather, they were able to stand inside. That caused part of the election to win. 
people were motivated to vote because they saw what happened to George Floyd. And that motivated a number of other people to come out and vote. And so here you go back and you win the Congress, you win the Senate, you win the presidency, and John Lewis passes away. You glorify his body by putting him in the Capitol, and then you can't pass the John Lewis crime bill. People become disenchanted when you do that. And what happens is that the vote total begins to drop. In Virginia, a lot of people who voted for Biden said, this don't mean nothing no more. We've got to begin to get those people reinvigorated. And I'm not saying, again, I'm not saying that climate change isn't important, but I can assure you that if I go to Compton and I speak to a lady who's in Compton, she ain't gonna tell me that the most important thing to her is climate change. That's not to say that it's not important. That's to say that if I'm speaking to someone who ain't got food on her table, if I'm speaking to someone who's struggling to get a job, if I'm speaking to someone whose kids are having trouble in school, to tell her that we're gonna make life better in 2050, th that's not what her immediate concern is. So as a person who has run a whole bunch of campaigns, if the Democrats don't make the issues in the campaign things that people are really into today, then not only is Biden gonna lose the next election, but we're gonna lose the Senate and the House. And I can tell you, some of them people in Texas and Florida they would reinstitute slavery if given the opportunity. They scare the hell out of me. I don't know if some of you have seen what some of those folks are talking about, but not only are they not talking about reparations, they're beginning to say, hell, we should lock up black people. We should kill the Latinos who come across the board. Some of the rhetoric that they propose scares the hell out of me. So we've got to make sure that the campaigns and the efforts that we make are consistent so that we win. Because at the end of the day, if you don't win the election, a lot of what you wanna do, whether it's reparations or a minimum wage, none of that gets done if you lose the election. And so we also wanna make sure that we train people in how to protect the wealth that they have. I could go on for a long time and you have my article that was written. So I will shut up and do questions if if anybody has them. But again, I'm a recovering politician. I was elected in California and elected a number of people to office because I'm a, campaigning is what I did for a living for a number of years. The bad thing for me is that I ended up taking a sip of my own medicine. I should have kept running other people rather than jumping into the office myself. But I saw some things that I could do and I'm proud of the time that I spent as an elected official. But we've got to make sure that we keep on a path that is realistic, that we're able to deliver. And we've got to make sure that those people who voted us into office, that we address their issues and not the issues that are, whether you're the progressive, that's a good thing, fine. But we've got to make sure that the issues that are being addressed first are the issues of the people who got you elected. Because if you don't, then you won't get elected again. And then from that, Dr. Foy, I'll shut up and do questions. All right, thank you. I think we have uh, only a couple more minutes uh, remaining. I want to be respectful of time. I think Dr. Ratton, you had your, your hand up, you have a question. And I'd love for you and uh, uh, Senator Wright to connect. Uh, and I know that you guys will have a different, uh, engaging conversation. Uh, you, did, you, did you have a question? Yeah, I'm I'm just really concerned about like the logic that you use to say that we shouldn't be talking about um climate change to people because that's not directly impacting them. Um is the same logic for you that you use um on saying that people shouldn't get reparations because they wouldn't know what to do with it. And I know you didn't use those words exam exactly, but I, I think it's deeply problematic because reparation is a response to a moral harm, period. Mm -hmm. And I do, I do agree that people need education, but we don't get to tell people that they shouldn't be paying reparations because these people don't know what they're doing. Like that's playing into 
you know, some of the same, you know, reasonings, you know, that we see those people who are winning offices. And just so you know, Israel was Cori Bush's campaign manager. Okay. Uh, so we know how to win offices. Okay. And okay. we think, and from our constituencies, climate change is one of the most important issues of people in a hood who can't put food on a table. Okay, well, I mean, we, we could, could go around. Let me, let me tell you another thing about me. So I chaired the Committee on Energy in California for 10 years. Uh, my, my background in the political arena is in energy. So I probably know a great deal more about the energy issue than do a lot of people. I was a finalist for the FERC uh, a few years ago, but, but, but setting that aside, if I go to Compton, as I said, and I speak to a lady about what is the issue concerning her today? Her son may have just been killed by the police. She has other issues that are confronting her. So when I tell her that what I'm going to do for her is something that's going to change the world in 20 or 30 years, I'm not saying that it's not important. What I'm saying is that as a political context, you've got to move on the things that people are immediately facing. And then what that allows you to do is it gives you the latitude to work on those other things. If you don't work on those things that they're immediately facing, you're going to lose the election. And if you lose the election, then you really won't be able to do climate change. Because if you get another nut like Trump in the place, you're going to be way out of line. I'm not saying, for example, that you should not do reparations. I'm simply saying that now what we have to do is ultimately define what it is. Is it simply we're going to give people checks? I don't think so. I think we want to define it in a way that makes people better. There may be, in some cases, money, but in other cases, it may be education. In some cases, it may be housing. In some cases, it may be health care. There may be a number of things that come back to cover that. But I think if we simply say we're going to write a check, that I think that we're shortchanging those people to whom that benefit came. So no, there should be reparations. It should have a quantifiable value so that people understand that there was a payment of some kind. But I want to be careful that we simply don't say, OK, there was reparations and you get one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, because I don't think that that would solve any of the problems that people have. OK, this is uh, I, uh, again, I want uh, I hope the two of you uh, connect and uh, carry on this conversation. Uh, and uh, this has been uh, certainly for me, a, a definitely a meaningful discussion tonight uh, and uh, a very engaging one. Uh, and we will continue this discussion in, in the future because uh, we're going to be partnering with a uh, grassroots uh, campaign uh, to try to move this forward. And uh, we hope that you would join us uh, as we attempt to work together. If I could, if I could close with one thing, uh, Dr. Foy, and again, it becomes important. One of the things that conservatives attempt to do is blame the victim for the things that happen. So somebody will say, well, slavery happened X number of hundred years ago. That's not a problem. And what I was trying to do is make clear that while slavery happened, you had Jim Crow. And then after Jim Crow, you had all of the other things that continued. In California, we had all the other racial divisions and police abuse and things that continue to happen. So the challenge becomes that people begin to blame the victim for many of the things that took place. In some cases, it's poverty. And if you go back and look, you know, what would have happened if those 18,000 men who fought with Sherman had gotten their 40 acres and a mule a couple of hundred years ago? What would the value of that have been had that occurred? What would have happened to those brothers who fought in World War II? What would have happened if their GI Bill that they were entitled to, they'd been allowed to use as they were supposed to, and they were denied by the banks. What would have happened to all of the Black people across the country who were attempting to buy real estate and the FHA drew a red line and said, you can't buy property over here because we're not going to let you buy that. What would their value have been had we not had that kind of racism take place? So again, we're not disagreeing that that happened. But what I'm saying 
is that when I hear people say, well, them brothers shouldn't have been doing crack cocaine. And I say to them, which I've said a number of times, there were no black people who grew cocaine. There were no black people who imported cocaine. There were no black people who financed the trade in cocaine. There were no black people who made the lion's share of the money in cocaine. So the cocaine business was something that was dumped on black people by white people. And so we wanna keep the economics clear so that you're clear exactly what it is you're fighting and you wanna be clear of the outcome. And again, I mean, as I looked at this last election, I mean, I hope it's not a for teller of what could happen. But if we're not able to connect to those people who marched for George Floyd, if we're not able to connect to those people who marched for Ahmed Arbery, if we're not able to connect to that group of people, then, you know, again, I've seen this movie before. We're going to be a one-legged man in an ass-kicking contest. All we'll be doing is supplying the ass. Okay. We'll close on that. That sounds right. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Can, can I use that quote? One of <laughs> man in an ass kicking contest. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. I, I just I, I appreciate uh, the the brilliance uh, that's on this uh, uh, on this panel tonight. Uh, Dr. Raglan, Miss Allison, and 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 uh, uh, Senator Wright. Just just brilliant brilliant thinkers. Uh, and just a, a level of appreciation. I just have a deep level of appreciation for well, that. Dr. Reagan, I hope uh, that Dr. Foy has your number and we'll we'll switch, we'll catch up. And I'll send you my article. In fact, if, 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 what they say it right now. Yeah, you, you <laughs> show me yours and you show me yours and I'll show you mine. <laughs> it's on like a pot of neck bones. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Well, Rabbi Lynn, uh, we're going to close. Rabbi Lynn is going to close us. Uh, thank, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I appreciate um, being at this gathering um, with some people um, with whom I've been on this path for a while. I know that we're all here because there is an Afro future in on Turtle Island that we must have quickly in our day, which is uh, something that we can say to our children that we were part of creating a culture of repair that included reparations, which we owed a great debt for the ongoing harms of racism in the United States. I know we're praying for an end to police capitalism, to corporate greed, and to the forces which prevent neighborhoods from flourishing, imprison and impoverish and deny education. And reparations can be a spiritual framework by which we inspire our communities to make active repair in the places that we live because we know it's going to take a million neighborhoods of movement building and partnerships to transform with our own agency the places we live. So I pray for this and for the well-being of everyone on the call and for the ongoing uh, success of our work and um, for a better future quickly in our day. Ashe. Ashe. Larry, you want to take us out? So good evening, everyone. Just want to once again just thank you uh, and look forward to working with you in the future. I'll say. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for staying up so late. Yeah. <laughs> Damn, it is late. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Bye. Good night. Yeah. All right.